Well, good time of the day. Uh, my name is Sergei Chernenkov. Uh, I assume that since you are here watching this uh, movie, uh, you already know who I am, but I will cover a little bit of it as well. I'm a completion, well intervention, uh, work over all kind of cased hole and open hole, uh, post completion uh, operations engineer, manager, supervisor in the past, uh, have 26 years experience in the EMP industry uh, where from 97 I was operating only internationally various part of the world, uh, Middle East, uh, West Africa, North Africa and uh, I'm currently off contract uh, looking for my new job during the um, uh, downturn which we all experience now and while I'm having good, well, free time, I think it would be maybe interesting for some of you uh, to have the experience shares in between us. Okay, uh, I was concentrated on mentoring my youngest staff in all the past operations which I had in all my past jobs. Uh, that was particularly beneficial, I think, for a lot of younger people. Uh, during the last couple of years. So what I do now, I pick up my last presentations uh, which I created three, four, five years ago. I will go through and record them on the video to share with you. Okay? Would it be completely free of charge or for reasonable fees? We will see how it will go, how many participants I have, if I need to turn it into small business or uh, if I'll keep it absolutely free. Okay. Now, I do have the website uh, which is called stconsultingonline.net where ST is my uh, initials from former spelling of first and last name uh, where my last name was spelled from starting from TCH. Uh, today it is different, so last few years uh, you will see only new spelling, but nevertheless the website was created in the end of 90s and uh, I did not change the name since then. Okay. Um, now, I think uh, I can possibly go into the first presentation uh, which will be my flagman uh, for you to see if you would be interested in future uh, sessions or not. And then uh, we'll go from there. Hello again, uh, good time of the day everybody, ladies, gentlemen, uh, whoever is watching this video now. And as I mentioned in my introduction earlier, um, the presentation which I would try to bring up to your attention now um, has nothing to do with particular technologies, but it's more like um, basic skills for troubleshooting an analysis of the results which you get during the troubleshooting which I believe is essential for our jobs uh, regardless if you work on the rig, if you work on the base of the service company if you run the engineering uh, department or if you are an engineer um, well myself um, I get understanding that I might need to develop my uh, natural abilities for troubleshooting and analysis uh, with formal training, it came to me maybe five, six years ago. Okay, uh, that's where I get concentrated on my first uh, personal development in the audits, in the um, troubleshooting methods, tools, and uh, presenting and analy analyzing the results. Okay, uh, on my website again, if somebody is visiting, uh, you can see uh, that I have several certificates uh, linked to audits and troubleshooting. Uh, for example, here, if I open my uh, page which is dedicated to this, you will see like I have five uh, certificates where uh, one is the uh, ISO, it's uh, well, uh, ISO 9001 2000. Eight, uh, certificate. If you are not familiar with ISO standards, uh, ISO 9001 is the system audits. Okay. Uh, now, at the same time, I had several courses which I held with Petroed, um, 
which gave me a little bit of systematic and methods understanding on how to lead the troubleshooting process. Okay, uh, useful stuff, useful stuff, not very expensive. So if you decide to do it one day when you have time, you can do it online uh, with reasonably good connection. It doesn't take much of the time, it depends on your capacity, of course, and dedicated uh, period which you can spend with your computer learning something for yourself. Um, and uh, well, the presentation which I would try to give now is real case uh, scenario, real case uh, which um, me, my team, and uh, our contractors have been working on uh, in Cameroon in 2015. I think it was end of 2015. Okay, so. Uh, what we need to realize is that success of any installation depends on the efficient operation of its equipment and the systems. Okay, you skip one of the factors and the installation is at risk. Okay, that's why we actually need to ensure that it works properly. Um, but despite that, we have efforts uh, which are input into the maintenance programs, uh, malfunctions and breakdowns still occur. Uh, and when these malfunctions occur, the efficiency and skill of the troubleshooter can significantly reduce the downtime and prevent uh, recurrence of the same problems. The skilled troubleshooter, that's what we're trying to be, the skilled troubleshooter follows the prescribed plan to track down the source of the problem. And troubleshooting is the process, okay, that's what we need to realize. It is a process of locating and repairing a malfunction or breakdown. Some equipment and systems are accompanied by troubleshooting guides, okay, but often not for all equipment in our industry. Well, equipment was on shelves, uh, regional equipment manufacturer papers are not available, uh, they're lost, whatever. We need to know what our systems are. So, to be a successful troubleshooter, one must thoroughly understand the normal operation of equipment and the system. Okay, so how do we understand this? First, of course, we need to realize and understand what the failure was. So when we know this, what, what was a failure, we establish a logical plan. Investigate the problem. Okay, how do we investigate the problem is a different thing, but uh, we need to evaluate investigation so that we can develop a theory as to the probable cause okay knowing that the problem occurred the failure occurred it does not give us immediately the cause of the issue okay and then when we start when we develop a theory we need to verify it and propose a cost effective and root cause linked solution after Next step, and most logical step, is take next reactions uh, to prevent future problems. So let's look at details of the process. Okay? There are four key aspects to investigate any problem with equipment or any problem with the system. How do we do it? Okay? We need to talk to operator. Okay? We need to inspect the equipment. We need to refer to schematics if they can be found and other technical materials and the, uh, we need to compare the same tools from the other sets, exactly the same tools, but maybe from the shelf, brand new uh, sets of kits. We need to research the maintenance and the history logs. Okay, this is very important and in the organizations where the maintenance records are not existent or at poor quality, it is very, very difficult to uh, troubleshoot any failures. So, talking to the operator, that was the first point which we uh, pointed out. The operator is actually one person who probably, not all, not always, not, okay, but probably knows the most about the malfunction equipment which you need to investigate. Okay, he runs it, uh, he assembles the pre job, uh, he pulls it out and investigates right after the job. So, he knows, he knows uh, basics and maybe a lot of details of the tool. So, when you speak with the operator, you need to encourage his cooperation, okay? You need to ask the questions and listen carefully what the operator or any person in the world is answering to you, okay? These are the keys of getting the information, okay? Do not be, and that's my advice, okay? 
uh, do not be uh, a source of the pressure for the operator. He's already under pressure, okay, because his equipment did not work. Um, uh, make him understand that he should not or will not be punished uh, if equipment was not uh, properly installed or did not properly operate, okay? And what he is doing now is helping us to verify uh, the root cause so we can prevent reoccurrence. It is very important to find all details about the symptoms of the problem, okay? Um, you need to ask when, where, uh, at which signs the problem had started, what the operator had as a feeling uh, before installation or before running the equipment into the well, okay? Uh, do not rely on your memory only, okay? With all the gadgets, uh, iPhones, which we have now, it's we tend to sleep the handwritten uh, records and notes, okay? Take notes. Try to take them as carefully as you can hear. You will analyze them later, but first you need to you know, take advantage that the person speaks with uh, speaks to you. Um, now, cameras, yes, phones, yes, they will help you to take the photos. Okay, and that's a very positive part in today environment that you can take the photos to illustrate your investigation process. Okay, and then you need to encourage the operator to go over all relevant details. Okay. Uh, you at this stage you should not evaluate any information you receive okay just take a notes and then your engineering background will allow you to look deep into the issue and then uh, it possibly will step ahead of those who look at the issue right at the moment of the failure okay uh, why I'm saying this you guys are engineers okay you have uh, wealth of operational experiences, supervisors, uh, technicians in the service companies sometimes do not have the same view on the problem as you would have, okay? And it's not their fault. It's, it's, it's just different education, different background. So that's main points which we discussed now about talking to the operator, okay? Uh, you need to take the part of in inspecting the failed equipment, okay, and you need to study the schematics and other technical materials, okay. Again, a minute ago I just said you have different background, you have different education, you have different experience, okay. Um, we cannot expect from the um, field technician uh, to be capable of reading all the schematics, okay. Uh, now it's very nice if they do. Uh, today and last 10-15 years more and more often you see that people do not understand the schematic, do not understand the uh, manuals, okay, especially when we're looking at the international market um, where not everybody can speak uh, good English or understand the languages, okay. So we must inspect malfunction equipment while it is in operation, okay, if possible. Now, if it's not possible, we need to observe the similar equipment uh, if one which failed cannot be assessed at the moment, okay? Now, if you have not witnessed prior tests before the equipment was utilized, uh, please do run the new set or equivalent set and pay close attention to every detail on what you see, okay? And compare the differences of the new or well-prepared equipment to malfunctioned one. Now, you try to get all technical materials. In today's world, it's easy. You have PDF, you have online libraries, you, have, you can contact manufacturer within a matter of minutes, uh, get the answers within a matter of hours or sometimes days, but uh, technical materials provide you as a troubleshooter with clear understanding of operational features and design specification of the equipment which was affected. Okay. The manufacturer's operation service manuals provide details on normal operations and sometimes include troubleshooting procedures for the equipment and systems. 
well not always not for every equipment but we just hope for it and the schematic diagrams and technical manuals explain how the system works okay and what is the uh, connection between the various components maintenance records and operational logs will give you or should give you the details on the service history and well any history of the previous uh, previous problems we said maintenance and service logs okay uh, while corrupted practices of some companies uh, will skip this important point but in environment of professional organizations it's taken seriously uh, well even today and you can find the maintenance and service logs uh, in very good detail now why it is vitally important to have the maintenance information to understand the root cause there is a simple concept okay a lot of you guys know this uh, well if it's not written it was not done as I say, I've seen the companies in my experience which said, okay, this is extra paperwork, we don't want it, we don't want to put uh, too much pressure on the service hands. Uh, well, they told us, they service it, uh, we run it. Okay? Now, it's your choice, but if it's not written, it was not done. If there are no maintenance records, there was no maintenance. Okay? And this principle is used by professional investigators working for the safety regulating authorities. Okay? Industrial insurance companies apply the same principles. And the quality auditors, as okay, I told you I'm a certified one, uh, apply the same principle. So auditors are taught if they cannot find any evidence of the maintenance records, they take it for granted. There was no maintenance program, it was not employed. So, again, link to this, absence of the maintenance logs in company records is often, not always, but often a reason of lost insurance compensation. Simple as that. Okay, we insure all our equipment, uh, we try to claim the loss in case of the uh, failures. Okay, it's never covered, the oil industry is never covered completely, because if you lost the well because of the small uh, equipment failure, okay, maybe... Uh, they will cover equipment failure but not loss of the well. Uh, but nevertheless, it's nice to have uh, at least some compensation, and this compensation will not be given to us if there is no maintenance. So, please, one more thing, and that's I believe it should be the good tip for the field personnel. Okay, uh, this is LAB, lead impression block okay and that's what I can tell you but how much this image tells you not much right and if we put any kind of a measuring reference on it uh, it's already looking better you see you see the uh, diameter of the imprint is about 18.6 inch oh sorry millimeters and uh, yeah at least you can say something better you can compare to something so for your troubleshooting experience in the future and if you are a supervisor or if you are running supervisors uh, to the field please ensure that everybody realize okay you need to use dimensional references when taking detailed close-up photos okay photos are nice too but if you have nothing to compare with it gives you nothing well, this is about it, about the basic and very basic troubleshooting uh, principles. Uh, if you want to develop your skills further, uh, there are online courses, there are courses in the training schools as well. And I think I will switch now to real case scenario uh, to demonstrate how uh, the particular principles and methods can be applied successfully in troubleshooting the failed equipment or the systems. So, that was a brief thing on methods uh, and principles which we try to apply when we've been uh, troubleshooting the failure of Weatherford retrievable bridge plug, okay, uh, the model WRP. 
and uh, I will guide you through the whole process which we've been taking and uh, you will see uh, if the principles which I discussed with you just a few minutes uh, ago will be actually or were actually applied. So uh, this is the RBP uh, which was not pulled from the well. This is another RBP, uh, sister tool, uh, which we put on the device to see uh, how and where the malfunctioning could be. Well, the story, background story was the RBP, a triple bridge plug, was run into the well to isolate the reservoir during the wellhead changeout. And after everything was done and the well bore was pressure tested, including the pressure control equipment, uh, we could not retrieve the RBP. We could latch on, we could not pull. Uh, now, at the end, we pulled the fishing tool, the uh, overshot, RBP overshot, with broken collets, and we could not figure out what happened with the well, I'm oh, sorry, with the RBP and what we need to do in the next step. So, uh, the troubleshooting of the RBP went through several stages. Okay, first we decided how we're gonna fish failed equipment, second, uh, we were trying to evaluate what actually happened to it uh, to understand what the problem was. Okay, and that's one of the first things what we need to do uh, to understand what was the failure. So, we <sighs> Run the overshot, we latch with a collet type retrieving tool, okay? And if you ever run the retrievable bridge plugs or any kind of packer, you know that one of the first uh, steps when we unset in the packer or bridge plug is equalization, okay? Now, after we latch with the uh, retrieving tool and pull up, we did not witness any equalization. Fluid level in depleted well should have dropped down Okay, and it was staying stable at surface. Okay, no change whatsoever. So we tried to pull the RBP. Okay, we applied hundred thousand uh, pull at the tool, and the driven tool came off. Uh, when we pulled the surface, uh, four out of eight collets of the tool were broken. Okay, now again, when I said we pulled two hundred thousand uh, pounds. It was not at one go. Uh, we've been trying to differentiate the uh, pool and uh, what we do downhole, but the uh, result was the same. We pulled out to surface and we had four out of eight collets broken. So, what were the possible causes? You see on these pictures, on the uh, left upper picture is the uh, view of the overshot, okay, with central lighting guide. Uh, and the uh, uh, second right picture was taken immediately uh, after we pulled it to the uh, to the floor. Uh, you see missing collets, which are were on this side here, where I'm pointing the mouse. Okay. We talked to the operator. Uh, we had a guy who had reasonable experience running this type of the tools. Um, and, but the only thing which he could tell us straight away uh, he linked it to potential debris in the well and because when we retrieved the tool we had a couple pieces of the uh, BOP rubbers. Well, is it valuable suggestion? Of course. One of the common causes uh, of lost uh, equalization with the packers is uh, debris. Okay, so that's that's several pieces of the rubbers which we found. Okay, uh, we investigated later on what it is, but as you see, you see on dimensional side, okay, it's about uh, three to four centimeters uh, each piece, and uh, yeah, it it looks like packer rubber or BOP rubber. So um, closer look suggested that these pieces were too large to clog the equalizing ports. Even that we know that pressure do amazing things, okay, we know how big pieces can be squeezed through the uh, big nozzles, okay, but nevertheless, uh, they, they've been too big for the equalization ports. You see the equalizing port is around here, okay. Um, overall discussion with uh, weather for specialists led to agreement that we had a problem with equalization. Okay, no doubts, everybody agree on this. So, why we did not have equalization? Well, we try to look at possible causes. So, debris plug the ports. Yes, could be the pieces of rubber, could be 
something else. Well, the well was clean, the scraper was run, uh, the well wasn't brain. Uh, normally, we would not expect any, well, reasonable size or reasonable amount of debris uh, unless Rick Hands dropped something. Um, but, uh, yeah. Now, what else we consider that we've been using the wrong uh, retrieving tool. Okay, can it be checked? Yes, of course. So we've checked all the records and uh, apparently uh, that was correct too. Why could not we open and share the uh, screws? Or maybe we use the wrong screws. Would it be the possibility? Yes, it would be possibility and we've checked. Uh, maybe we did not slack off enough to uh, shift down the equalizing sleeve. Could it be the uh, possibility? Yes. Now, the biggest question is why only four out of eight collets of the tool were broken. Okay, why not one? Why not all eight? Okay, what could lead to the failure of four collets on the same side? Okay, so we looked at the uh, possible causes. Now, yield was exceeded. Of course, otherwise they would not break. Okay, so we we exceeded the yield somewhere. Okay, uh, but why? If we have eight collets and if they all designed uh, to be to withstand a certain amount of uh, strain, um, why only four had broken? Okay, so these collets were the only load bearing points. Okay, we'll look later on at this. Round two, model size, whatever. Can we mismatch the parts? Yes, it's possibility in the workshop uh, if there is no. Uh, QAQC process employed. Uh, there is a possibility that uh, tool was assembled with wrong parts. Okay, so we needed to check on this. Now, was it only thing which we considered? Okay, apparently not. Uh, we had wealth of experience in our team, uh, ages, uh, and we actually decided, yeah, we we need we need to go further. Okay, it's not only uh, talking to the uh, operator. Of the two, but we need, we need to think what else could be wrong. So we start working on developing theory uh, to the probable cause. Okay. Some additional evidences which we collected during the process uh, were okay. Look at the picture. Uh, equalizing sleeve. The collet popped out by brute force. Okay. When we're pulling up, we're actually pulling on this mandrel here. Okay. This is the lower part. What should happen is that this collet are staying inside of the uh, equalizing uh, sleeve. Instead, the equalizing sleeve need to go down. Okay. What happened in reality is that we dragged the collet and had expansion of the collets okay, over the mandrel uh, from its position. So why? We need to look at this uh, as well. We've checked the shear screws. Okay. We pulled out the shear screws on the RBP, which was retrieved finally, okay, which were retrieved by the uh, brute force, okay. But uh, the shear screws were the same, okay, as has to be, but they were not shared, which means there was no tool movement uh, of the sleeve to 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 shear uh, and open the equalizing ports. Equalizing sleeve seem to be in the original place. We measured on the uh, another set and uh, compared with the uh, drawings, the equalizing uh, sleeve did not, did not move. What else can be wrong? Some more findings. Okay, We found that the uh, safety sub on the uh, mandrel uh, had a crack. Okay. I'm just listing the uh, problems which we found and then uh, we'll look at them later. Okay, we had a dent, the imprint mark on the fishing neck. Okay, here over the edge you can see the nice dent, okay, which was done by something solid, okay, which should not be there. Okay, um, so we realized that the fishing collet slid through the equalizing sub of the pulling tool which is not normal. Okay. So these collets should stay inside of the equalizing sleeve of the tool. And 
what we've checked due to earlier evidences okay just corresponding of the different sizes and the uh, well our imagination went way further than uh, uh, from the day one um, the safety sub uh, outside diameter was corresponding to the internal diameter of closed around these collets okay and collapsed collets okay around the safety sub can pass through internal diameter of the equalizing sleeve okay sorry for my typo that's not if it's of equalizing sleeve okay so our theory from there our theory was ready okay if the equalizing sleeve of the fishing tool okay was not pushing on the equalizing sleeve of the rbp then what could happen it stopped on the fishing neck okay a result no equalization the collets possibly had latched on the safety sub and that's where the excessive strain resulted in the crack you see the crack here and then the collet was dragged by partial grip on the safety sub okay, through the equalizing sleeve of retrieving tool the diameter here is less than the diameter of the fishing neck here on the left photo right so your collets did not expand to the required od and then they could be dragged through equalizing sleeve of retrieving tool and so four out of eight collets were broken once they slid through the equalizing sleeve here once it's popped out okay uh, they they've been broken because they were not supported uh, by equalizing sleeves body tool released okay while it was never latched on the fishing neck all these previous steps it was the uh, uh, theory which my team or our team developed okay uh, Weatherford Regional Management had evaluated the findings presented to them uh, by uh, their domestic personnel and came up with non-compliance report with the same conclusions as ours. Okay, so the mitigating measures which were described in non-compliance report and the main change which we need to implement as additional stabilization uh, of the retrieving tool uh, is adding the centralizer. The current guide which you see okay and that's what we conclude the current guide does not provide firm stabilization okay to ensure that equalization sleeve of the tool and rbp are in contact uh, what happened then is that uh, with inclination in the well we had about 45 degrees um, the tool was not properly guided it was laying a little bit on the uh, low side and we had only partial catch on, on the wrong side of the rbp okay now how easy it would be to understand this at the rig site I would say nearly impossible okay uh, with results of the investigation which we had and if the records are kept in the operating company and the service company uh, most likely in similar conditions if they occur people will start thinking that it is possible due to the uh, let's say inconsistency in the design of the retrieving tool versus the retrievable bridge plug. This presentation is finished now. Well, thank you for those who actually stood through <laughs> complete, complete presentation. Uh, I would appreciate your comments uh, on the page where you downloaded this uh, uh, presentation from. Okay, whether it's LinkedIn or my website. Uh, well, it's published in several locations. And if you have any questions in respect to this, uh, I would be happy to answer on the same chat forums. Okay, thank you very much. Bye.